have given them bread from heaven. Let us pray. O oh God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruit of your redemption, who live and reign with God, the Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be, blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All on earth thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee. Infinite thy vast domain everlasting is thy reign infinite thy vast domain everlasting is thy reign hark the loud Celestial hymn, angel choirs above are raising, cherubim and 
seraphim in unceasing chorus praising fill the heavens with sweet accord holy 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 lord fill the heavens with sweet accord holy 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 lord Take the next couple minutes to stretch and use the restroom if you need to, located in the hallway to your back right, and then we will, um, I'll introduce our speaker for the evening. All right, good evening everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth installment of our Eucharist lecture series here at Notre Dame Seminary in honor of our Archdiocesan Year, uh, Year of the Eucharist. My name is Jordan Haddad, and I'm the Director of Lay Ministry Programs and Lay Formation here at the seminary. Although we were adoring our Lord in the Eucharist just moments ago, please join me in a brief opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us take a moment to remember that we are still in the presence of God. Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us the gift of your risen self in the most holy Eucharist, in fulfillment of your promise to be with us until the end of the un, until the end of the age inspire us with a deeper love understanding and appreciation for your real presence in the eucharist so that we might always seek your face 
and in seeking your face, be ever more conformed to your image and likeness. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our presenter this evening is Dr. David Liberto. Dr. Liberto has served as a professor of dogmatic and historical theology since 2001 and the director of the Master of Arts in Theological Studies program since 2018 here at Notre Dame. In his work here at NDS, he has formed an entire generation of priests and laity throughout Louisiana and beyond in the central mysteries of the Christian faith. Alongside his work of teaching, he has also published several, several scholarly articles and is currently working on a book-length treatment of the psychological analogy of the Trinity. Dr. Liberto will be speaking tonight on the real presence of the Eucharist. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you all for coming. We'll just try to keep that there. I want to open with a few comments before I begin. Uh, I did write a paper. Uh, my first comment is I'm going to read the paper, but uh, as is my, uh, my tendency, I, I may get off track. I try to explain things as I go, and then before long, I'm off on a little tangent, so be patient with me. Uh, number two is, uh, we were told in these talks to try to keep them as non-technical as possible, and I have failed to do that. Uh, not because I, I'm trying to, in, in, in any way, distance myself from my audience, but I'm dealing with a topic that really is almost impossible to, uh, not to get technical, at least in some sense. But I try, as I go, to explain the terms that I use at least in some cursory way, which I hope will be helpful, but it may also give us more to talk about in the Q&A session. As you heard, I do teach uh, dogmatic theology, and the courses I teach are all about mysteries, and the title of the talk is The Real Presence, The Mystery of the Eucharist, so you're going to hear a lot about mystery. And the last thing I'd like to say is, um, it, with regard to an experience I had a few years ago and how I've thought about this experience uh, in light of what I do as a theologian. My wife and I had gone to the Grand Canyon and you drive up on the bus. Uh, you're not allowed to drive your car. You drive your car to one place and they bus you into the, to this site. And you get out the bus and you, know, you kind of see this thing over there. And you can kind of see the other side, too, but you just you can't see the canyon. And so you walk closer and closer, and there, no, there are no rails here. You just walk right on up. And the closer you get, the more of the canyon you see, until you can actually walk right to the edge, and you see how deep it really is. I liken that to really what we do in theology. The other side is the mystery. We can kind of see the mystery, but the closer we get, the more we come to understand the chasm between us and the mystery. And as you stand there on this edge, which many people were doing, some were scaring me because they were taking their little phones with their handle backwards, <laughs> taking their picture, and I'm like, oh boy, hope someone's ready with a net. But the closer you got, it was kind of scary, but you stood there, and then you got this awesome sense of the depth and the majesty of this thing called the Grand Canyon. Theology is like that too. The closer you get to the mystery, you, you see the, the grand chasm between yourself and the mystery. There is a sense in which the more you know about these mysteries, whether it be the Trinity or the Incarnation or the Eucharist, I think the more you appreciate your own finitude and how holy other God himself is and all these mysteries that we deal with. So without further ado, uh, I'm warning you, I may take you up to the edge. You may feel a little dizzy as we approach, 
but hang in there. Uh, we'll come back safely when it's all done. The real presence, the mystery of the Eucharist. The Catholic faith is all about mysteries. When we talk about mysteries in a theological context, however, we mean something different than when we talk about mysteries in other contexts. We might talk about a mystery novel where the reader tries to follow the clues and figure out who the culprit is before that revelation of the murderer given by the author at the climax of the novel. Mysteries can also apply to natural phenomenon. Inasmuch as science has not plumbed all the mysteries of the universe, there is still much hidden, much unknown about our world and how things work, whether that be on the microscopic or the macroscopic level. In other words, whether it's a subatomic particle, such as a quark, a lepton, or a boson, or on the cosmic level, investigating black holes and quasars, there are still many mysteries just waiting to be uncovered about our natural world. The basic understanding of a mystery is that there's something hidden yet to be discovered, something yet to be revealed. The difference with dealing with mysteries of the faith is that unlike the mystery novel, whose mystery is within the realm of fiction, or the mysteries of the universe, whose mysteries are in the natural, observable world, the mysteries of the Catholic faith are of another order altogether, what we call the supernatural order. These are mysteries in the full theological sense. That is, they have to do with the mystery of how God exists in himself, and here I'm talking about the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, or how God works within the economy of salvation. In here, we're dealing with mysteries such as the incarnation, grace and justification, the sacraments, and the church. What all mysteries of the supernatural kind have in common is that they deal with something that is hidden or unknowable to us by natural reason, reason unaided. The mysteries of the Catholic faith are unique in that they are dealing with something of the supernatural order and require revelation for us to know anything about them. Of course, once a mystery is revealed, say in, in, in sacred scripture, that's just the beginning. The church in and through her magisterial teaching, sheds more light on a given mystery, oftentimes in teachings that we would call dogmatic formulations. Above and beyond this magisterial teaching, the church's theologians do their best to peer ever more deeply into the mysteries of the faith. But of course, the mysteries of the faith deal with realities that are transcendent, so profound, so different from what we can apprehend, either with our senses or with our intellects, that they are truly beyond comprehension. And so despite the incomprehensible nature of these mysteries, or maybe because of it, the theologian sets out on a journey of discovery, a journey of fides querens intellectum, to use that dictum of St. Anselm. The task is to examine, to probe, to contemplate, and yes, to marvel at the mysteries before him. Our journey this evening will be one of peering into the mystery of the Eucharist. As Catholics, we affirm certain things about this most august sacrament. We affirm that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so it is. But the way that the, the divinity is present is not the way that the soul of Christ is present, which is not the way that the body is present under the species of the bread. There's a mystery here. 
We as Catholics talk about the real presence, and Christ is, as Trent taught, truly, really, and substantially present in the Eucharist. And yet for all the talk of the real presence, the body of Christ is not present locally in the sacrament, at least not according to that great angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. There's a great mystery here. In fact, although we affirm that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, the mode of presence, what we might call the sacramental mode of presence, is different from the natural, physical, and integral mode of presence of the resurrected Christ. There's a great mystery here. So my task this evening is to take you on a journey. It's a theological journey that takes you ever closer to the mystery. But let me prepare you now. The probing of any mystery involves a paradox of sorts, what I was describing earlier. You see, the more you examine the mystery and probe its depths, the more you realize how much you don't know. Or better yet, the more you realize your own limitations, be they linguistic, intellectual, even ontological, in face of the mystery. This is why the best efforts of the theologian begin in study, continue in contemplation, but end in doxology. To start our journey, our investigation of the real presence, let us begin with a quote from the Council of Trent, its 13th session, which deals with the Eucharist. So I quote a, a large section from the first chapter of that session. The Council states, in the first place, the Holy Synod teaches and openly and simply confesses that in the august sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, after the consecration of the bread and wine, our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is truly, really, and substantially contained under the species of those sensible things. For neither are these things mutually repugnant, that our Savior himself always sitteth at the right hand of the Father in heaven according to the natural mode of existing, and that nevertheless he be in many other places sacramentally present to us in his own substance by a manner of existing which though we can scarcely express it in words, yet we can by the understanding illumined by faith conceive and we ought most firmly to believe to be possible unto God. For thus all our forefathers, as many as were in the true church of Christ, who have treated of this most holy sacrament, have most openly professed that our Redeemer instituted this so admirable a sacrament at the Last Supper, when after the blessing of the bread and the wine, he testified in express and clear words, and gave them his own very body and his own very blood. That's, again, from the Council of Trent. With this teaching of Trent as our foundation, let us proceed by way of answering four questions. So when I thought about the talk, I mean, there are so many different things I really could talk about with regard to the real presence, and then I realized that I had, you know, a limited amount of time, and so I settled on these four. Although if you have others, you get to ask that later. These are the four questions I'd like to discuss. And really, the first one is the principal one, and the other three follow so directly from it that they get m much shorter treatment. So the first question is, what is the real presence? I mean, what do we mean when we say real presence? And how does it differ from the natural mode of Christ's bodily presence? And of course, we heard that in that first chapter. There are two different modes. What is that about? Number two, how are we to understand Christ to be present, body, blood, soul, and divinity? Uh, 
Uh, that is mentioned in the first canon, by the way, which I will quote later from the Council of Trent, same session. Question number three, is the whole Christ contained under each species and under any part of each species? And if so, how? Number four, should we render to the Eucharist the worship due to God alone? Or is it some other form of veneration? So to our first question, which, uh, like I said, will take much of our time here. To our first question concerning the real presence, we see where the language of the real presence comes from. This is the language of the Council of Trent, that Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained under the species, that is the appearance of bread and wine. This is the essence of the mystery. What appears to be bread and wine, what was truly and really and substantially bread and wine, is now truly, really, and substantially Christ, whole and entire. Yet after the consecration has affected this conversion of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, our eyes still see bread and wine. We taste bread and wine. Our faith tells us that this is really Christ, and yet our senses are not wrong. They simply cannot peer into the mystery of the sacrament itself, the reality of the sacrament. For here, it's only the eyes of faith that can discern the real presence. This is where the supernatural nature of the Eucharist is of a wholly other sort compared to the miracles wrought by Christ himself in his earthly sojourn. Think for a minute of Christ's first public miracle, the wedding feast at Cana. Christ changes water into wine. This seems like a, a clear uh, foretaste of the Eucharist, but it's of a different sort, isn't it? The first sign in John's Gospel is a supernatural act. But unlike the, the Eucharist, this miracle involves a discernible change and so is more properly considered a miracle. The substance of water is changed into the substance of wine. That's a substantial change. A substantial change like the one we have here is a change of one thing into another thing. Philosophers use the language of substance to talk about the underlying reality of a thing. and answers the question also, what is it? When we ask what something is, we are really inquiring about its substance. With the miracle at Cana, there is a change, a substantial change. One thing is changed into another thing. But with the change of substance, there is a corresponding change in accidents. Philosophers use the language of accidents to describe those properties of a given substance. They inhere in the substance. And that's what the Latin word means, accidere, to adhere to or cling to. The substance might be the underlying reality of what something is, but what we see, what we taste, what we experience are the accidents of a thing, the accidents of a substance. If we follow the teaching of Aristotle, there are nine accidents which include a thing's quantity, quality, relation, and location. So the water turned into wine, a substantial change, looks like wine, smells like wine, and most importantly for the guests involved, tastes like wine. This is what one would normally expect with a substantial change. A change in substance would normally entail a change in accidents because it is precisely in and through those accidents that we're even able to discern a substantial change at all. Or think about Christ's 
miracle of multiplication of loaves and fish in John 6. Although we may not call this a substantial change, like water into wine, nevertheless, it is another demonstration, another sign of Christ's divine power to do the supernatural, the miraculous. Here the change is not a substantial one. We might consider it an accidental one. Christ takes the five loaves and the two fish, and he multiplies them. There's a change in quantity. Yet here again, because an accidental change is discernible, there is evidence, if you will, of the miraculous and the supernatural power of Christ's action. We should note, before we move on, that this sign, along with Christ's walking on the water, immediately precede the bread of life discourse in that same sixth chapter of John, who does not record the institution of the Lord's Supper, but instead has that bread of life discourse in its place. After giving them bread for their bellies, Christ then teaches about the bread of life, what we'll be talking about tonight. Unless we eat his very flesh, he says, and drink his very blood, we will not have eternal life. The same divine power that can change water into wine, that can multiply the loaves and the fish, is the same divine power that can convert humble bread and wine into the very body and blood of Christ. But in the Eucharist, the supernatural nature of the real presence is of a very peculiar sort. We do not discern any change in the species. The bread and wine do not undergo any accidental change. They don't change in appearance. There's no change in taste, no change in quantity. And yet when Christ says, this is my body and this is my blood, we believe him because his words are truth and life. He is truth and life itself. What was natural food, bread and wine, has now become our spiritual food, that food we need on our way to heaven. The dogmatic teaching of Trent which we read earlier, clearly conveys the very mysteriousness of the, of the sacrament. If you recall, the natural mode of Christ's presence at the right hand of the Father is contrasted with the sacramental mode of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The latter mode is distinct from the former, but the substance is one and the same. This is the key to understanding this mystery aright. We want to affirm that the one present at the right hand of the Father is none other than the one present in the Eucharist, but the mode of presence is different. Getting the balance of unity and distinction, the unity of substance, the distinction of mode, is key to understanding the church's teaching here, as it is in other mysteries. Uh, we find this kind of uh, being able to find the via media as key to understanding various mysteries, as you hear. In Trinitarian theology, for instance, one is guided by two principles. I call them the principle of unity and simplicity on the one hand, and the principle of real distinction on the other. Uh, for instance, if you, now this is where you come into problem. If, you, if you're not balanced in your approach and you over, overplay, say, the unity principle there, you may end up in something called modalism. And if you overplay the distinction principle, you may end up in either tritheism or Arianism. Christology has uh, a similar uh, 
two-principled approach. Christology is governed by two basic principles, what I call the unity principle and the distinction principle. The unity of the divine person, there's one divine person who subsists in, a, in, uh, in two distinct natures. That's the distinction principle. So in the Eucharist, there are two basic principles as well. These are the principles of unity, <coughs> excuse me, and distinction. Not the same principles as we talked about governing our Trinitarian theology, but two new principles as applied to this mystery, to the Eucharist. We must keep the balance between the identity principle, same body, same substance, and the difference principle, different modes of presence. Uh, by the way, if you can see how this could cause problems if you are unbalanced, right? So if you emphasize same body, same substance, but you're weak on the different modes of presence, you may have what we might call a kind of hyper-realist understanding of the Eucharist like, um, like Radbertus. Uh, and he was taken to task by certain theologians for doing that. Whereas if you uh, undermine the same body, same substance, and you certainly recognize that there are two different modes, you may end up like some of the Protestants who uh, talked about Christ as being merely spiritually present. But for us Catholics, the bread becomes the body of Christ. That's the identity. It is the same Christ. But the very substance of his body, present as it surely is in the, in the sacrament, is present under what we might call an alien species, under the appearance of bread in the case of that species. It's under a different mode. Here the very body of Christ existed a mode that is not its natural mode. We might call it a supernatural mode. The natural mode of existing of any substance is to exist with its accidents that are commensurate with it. As an example, the substance that is the person John is naturally present with and discernible through the accidents of John. We see John's shape, his height, his hair color. We can discern John's intelligence, humor and wit, all accidental qualities of John. And this is true of Christ in his natural mode, even if that natural mode at present is the resurrected and glorified Christ. So Christ in his natural bodily mode has accidents in more or less a normal accidental manner. And I'll say more or less because, of course, uh, Christ in his resurrected body may transcend some of the normal uh, accidental qualities that we would assume. But this much, I think, the church would teach clearly just what Trent did, that we say Christ is at the right hand of the Father. Now, even that's a mystery, isn't it? Because the Father doesn't have a right hand. Uh, that's really a metaphor, right, that he's going to a place of, of glory and honor. But we do believe that Christ in his resurrected body is local. Where? I don't know. But somewhere. So after the resurrection, and doubting Thomas comes and sees him, and puts his hands in those wounds, it's still a real bodily presence. It's a local presence. Uh, it would be a, a, a sort of uh, monophysitism if we thought that in and through the resurrection and the glorification of his body, that it ceased being truly bodily, right? That somehow it might morphed into the uh, ubiquitous nature of the divinity. That wouldn't be quite right. So Christ in his natural bodily mode has accidents. In other words, that body has a quantity, it has a quality, it has a location. 
and other accidents that would apply to it. And these accidents inhere within the substance of Christ's integral humanity. In the sacramental mode of presence, however, the substance of Christ's body is present in a mode that is more akin to the way a spiritual substance exists, although even here it excels that mode as well. For instance, a spiritual substance, like an angel, is not subject to quantity, as quantity applies only to material substances. Along with this, place or location does not apply to an angel, because since there is no dimensive quantity, there is no way to locate an angel. And this gets us into that uh, so-called medieval uh, question, how many angels can you fit on the, fit on the uh, head of a pin? I'm not sure that they actually asked that question, but questions like it were asked because you're dealing with something quite metaphysical, actually, dealing with an immaterial substance and the properties thereof, right? Angels simply do not exist in space and time as material substances do, so location does not really apply to them. Or think of the immaterial human soul. It is in the body and informs the body, we say, in a way that is present in every part of the body, whole and entire, without ever being divided. And yet the substantial presence of Christ in the sacrament though in some ways similar to the properties of spiritual substances, like angels and souls, exceeds these modes as well. For an angel, although not localized, is not ubiquitous either. Can't be in many places all at the same time, we don't think. In this way, the substantial sacramental mode of presence of Christ in the Eucharist is like the divine substance, at least in some way, in that it can't be localized, yet it can be in many places, all at the same time, wherever the species themselves are found. In other words, if you think about all the tabernacles in the world, is Christ sacramentally present there? The answer is yes in a very mysterious way, in a, in a quite profound way, what Christ couldn't do while he was here on earth in his own natural mode, he can now affect within the sacramental mode of presence. And it kind of brings new meaning to, and I will be with you always. And here again, we're at the heart of this mystery. But Trent warned us of this when it said that Christ is sacramentally present to us in his own substance by a manner of existing which though we can scarcely express it in words, the council said, yet we can by the understanding illumined by faith conceive and we most firmly believe to be possible to God. As a last word on the real presence, especially with regard to the special or sacramental mode of presence, let us turn to a great dogmatic theologian from the 19th century, Matthias Schaben. Schaben remarks about the divine mode of presence of the Eucharist when he writes, and I quote, when we ascribe a divine mode to the body of Christ, we do not mean formally to appropriate to it, on the basis of the hypostatic union, the mode of existence proper to the divine nature and person. In other words, we know already that Christ, who is fully divine, is absolutely omnipresent and ubiquitous with regard to his divine nature. There's no question about that, but that's not what we're talking about here. But we are making a kind of comparison between the sacramental presence and that absolutely ubiquitous omnipresence of the divine nature. And so back to our quotation. We say no more in it 
uh, I'm sorry, we say no more in that it shares in a certain of the properties characteristic of the mode of existence enjoyed by the divine person in nature. Somewhat as our soul shares in the life and glory of God through grace. For all that, it is ever true that this unique supernatural participation in the divine mode of existence predicated of Christ's body, and here he's talking about the sacramental presence, like the grace and glory of his soul, is not formally but virtually based on and flows from its hypostatic union and the person of God's Son. Because the body of Christ is the body of the Son of God, it receives through the power of, the, of, of that same divine person, inhabiting it, the unique privilege similar to the prerogative of the person himself, but in limited measure of being present, indivisible, and undivided in many places and in the innermost recesses of things." End quote. Now that's from a, a fabulous work by Shaban called The Mysteries of Christianity. So to our second question. Th that ends my treatment of the first question. Okay, I told you it was gonna be the longest part. Uh, so we're, we're already near the end of the paper because that is kind of the, the toughest and the longest part. And much more could be said, but we are constrained by time. To our second question, how are we to understand Christ to be present, body, blood, soul, and divinity? We often say that, but I'm not sure that we all understand exactly what we mean when we say that. <laughs> Let me tell you what it doesn't mean, which I didn't even write in here, but let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the bread and the wine, either together or, or, or distinctly as two different species, that, that the bread is converted into the divinity. Nothing can be turned into the divinity. All right. So the way that the divinity is present is not the same way, even though we're talking about a sacramental mode, but still, this is based on the hypostatic union, which I'll talk about in just a minute. The way that the divinity is present is not the same way that the body is present. Okay, so m maybe some of you are already scratching your head. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that uh, in the Q&A. Hopefully, some of what I say here will clear that up. Although clearly taught in the first chapter of the 13th session of Trent, as cited above, this teaching is explicitly taught in the first canon of that same session. The church teaches what to believe, many times just teaches the what. The theologian has the task of explaining the teaching. That Christ is present whole and entire in the, in the Eucharist requires an examination of the church's teaching about the incarnation. So I used that term earlier, hypostatic union. What, what is that about? It is clear that Christ is fully God and fully man. That's clear teaching of the church. One divine person subsists, okay, a little technical language there. You might just think exists in exist in two distinct natures. And that union of the natures in the divine person is called the hypostatic union. Hypostatic comes from the Greek term uh, hypostasis or epostasis, say it either way. More or less in this context at least means personal. Personal union. We believe one divine person, God Almighty, second person of the Trinity, assumed the human nature. And so now he subsists, exists in, two really radically distinct natures. He's God Almighty, never ceases being God Almighty, and yet assumes to, him say, to himself, as it says in that hymn, in uh, Philippians 2, 5 and following, he talks about Christ being in the form of God, but then he took on himself the form of a slave or a servant, talking about the incarnation, right? 
that's what we, that's what, what, we, what we believe about the incarnation. God Almighty comes in a new mode. We can use mode language here again uh, and, and use it uh, to, to try to describe how the second person now exists in a human mode. We can say that within a human nature. The, the very eternal one, God Almighty, now exists in space and time. That immutable, impassable one, second person of the Trinity, is now mutable, impassable. In fact, dies on the cross. So that's the mystery of the incarnation. That's a whole nother talk for another day. But you really can't understand the Eucharist and how Christ is present whole and entire without doing a little bit of the Christology. So back to the text. The hypostasis or person of the word, second person of the Trinity, assumes our lowly human nature. The natures, although distinct, are inseparable in this personal union. So if the bread is converted into the body of Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist, and that body is none other than the body of the glorified Christ, albeit in another mode, then there can be no separation of the body from its blood, its soul, and the divine nature, which is united to it by the hypostatic union. No better explanation of this can be given than that as found in the angelic doctor St. Thomas Aquinas. In that wonderful work of his, which all theologians know or should know, called the Summa Theologiae, in the third part, uh, that contains his Christological section. Um, I teach Christology, I'm teaching that this semester, we've worked through much of that section. This is what St. Thomas writes concerning this question. It is absolutely necessary to confess according to Catholic faith that the entire Christ is in the sacrament. Yet we must know that there is something of Christ in this sacrament in a twofold manner. First, as it were, by the power of the sacrament, the vis sacramenti. Second, from natural concomitants. By the power of the sacrament, there is under the species of this sacrament that into which the pre-existing substance of the bread and wine is changed, as expressed by the words of the form, which are effective in this as in any other sacrament. For instance, here by the words, this is my body, or this is my blood. Meaning, from the very power of the sacrament, what, what is, what's happening is that the substance of the bread is converted into the very substance of the body of Christ. But because that body is the body of the integral Christ, everything that belongs to Christ comes along, is concomitant with it, including his blood, his soul, integral humanity, and his divinity. Because don't forget, he's a divine person who in his own one divine person has united those two natures in himself. He subsists in those natures. So to finish the quotation from Thomas, but from natural concomitants, there is also in this sacrament that which is really united with that thing wherein the aforesaid conversion is terminated, meaning with the body. For if any two things be really united, and surely that's the case with regard to Christ and his soul and blood with regard to the body and with regard to the divinity, then wherever the one is, there must be the other also, since things really united together are only distinguishable by an operation of the mind. Meaning, we can, we can uh, talk about the soul of Christ, 
we can mentally abstract the soul of Christ from the body of Christ, but in Christ himself, especially the risen Christ, they're always united. And so ends our treatment of the second question. On to number three. Is the whole Christ contained under each species and under any part of each species? Again, the answer is easy because it's answered definitively by Canon 3 of that same session of Trent. All right? And so I quote, the whole Christ is contained under each species, meaning under the species of bread is the whole Christ. Under the species of wine is the whole Christ. This is why it, it need, it's not necessary that you would receive under both species, because you get the whole Christ under e either species. This flows from our understanding of natural concomitance as explained above. If the power of the sacrament converts the bread to the substance of the body of Christ, and the whole Christ is present, since whatever is united to the body is present wherever the body is, the same would apply to the species of the wine. By a natural concomitance, the whole Christ is present. But what about parts of the host, or maybe a portion of the wine? Does a part of the host or a portion of the consecrated wine contain the whole Christ? The answer is yes. No question what the answer is from Trent. But, but the reason is what we've explained already about the sacramental mode of presence of Christ in the sacrament. The answer is yes, since Christ's body is not present in its natural mode, where dimensive quantity would be present in its own accidental mode, and therefore the very natural mode, the body of Christ can be uh, separated one part from the other. Now, of course, in his glorified state, I don't know how that would be possible, but in a natural mode where there is dimensive quantity, you can divide something. But if you have a sacramental mode the way we're describing it, there's no way to divide Christ. You're dividing the species, that's true. But because of the mode of the presence, each fragment of the host contains no less than the whole Christ. You always get the whole. You ever get in line and maybe you're last and the priest has got the one host and he's got two people and he has to break it in half? You don't ever have to feel like, oh, I was shortchanged. Not, not with the Eucharist. You've got the whole Christ. Since Christ is present in the sacramental mode, Thomas calls it a substantial mode. And, and by the way, even all the very accidents of the natural mode or present, but in a substantial mode. Okay, and I'm gonna to say too much more about that because that's kind of a mind blower. Um, but that's, that's how we deal with it. I mean, the whole Christ is there. Even his dimensive quantity is present, but not in a dimensive quantitative mode. Okay, so if you're getting a little dizzy now, I understand, but bear with me, I'm almost done. Again, the words of St. Thomas are very clear on this. Since the conversion of the substance of the bread is terminated at the substance of the body of Christ, and since according to the manner of substance the body of Christ is properly and directly in this sacrament, such distance of parts is indeed in Christ's true natural body, which, however, is not compared to the sacrament according to such distance, but according to the manner of its substance. So the very body of Christ in this sacramental mode is having its own dimensive quantity, but only in a substantial mode. Again, this is, in a certain sense, uh, the greatness of this sacramental mode where you always get the entire Christ. You can't divide him in any way where you wouldn't get the whole Christ. Uh, and we could go on. And so let me end with this last question. Very brief treatment, but we need to end because... <laughs> Got to give you a little time for Q&A. And now we come to our fourth and final question. Should we render to the Eucharist the worship due to God alone? Now, obviously, we were just here venerating the Eucharist. Uh, but 
that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has the same idea, but this is the Catholic idea. This is again found in Trent, same session, 13th session of Trent, Canon 6. Canon 6 says that we worship, venerate the Eucharist with the very worship by which we worship Almighty God. We worship the Eucharist because in worshiping the Eucharist, we worship none other than God himself, the second person of the Trinity. The same worship is due to the Eucharist as to the incarnate Lord, because the Eucharist is the sacramental real presence of that same Lord. This is a great mystery, but one that forces us to praise our Eucharistic Lord on our knees. Thank you. Okay, so I know we're supposed to go to seven, but I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to going further if, if we need to, uh, but we'll take your questions if you have any. Kind of, um, practical question. Yeah. The, uh, some altars have a, a corporal that goes across the whole altar. If uh, um, there was um, a ciborium of unconsecrated hosts placed on the, on, the, on the altar, on a ciborium, and a celebrant in the mass went through the whole complete mass, but it wasn't his intent to consecrate that ciborium. Right. Are those hosts the blessed sacrament, or does it remain the unconsecrated hosts? Uh, that really is a question more for the sacramental theologian. Um, I, I hate to even answer the question. Uh, I think if it's not his intent, then my answer would be no, and uh, I don't know whether you can do something like a, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. I mean, that, that's really not my, my ballpark, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. No, I'm more theoretical. You see, you ask me a practical question. It's, <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Now, if Father Deo was here, he'd answer that in, in two seconds. You know, my instinct is one thing, but I hate to give you an answer on my instinct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be shy. I'm sure you have questions. There's no bad question, by the way. I, I like them all. I'll ask you a question, uh, David. Um, so how should we think about um, when we receive the Eucharist, um, how should we think about like at what point is it no longer, when right. we receive it, after we receive it, is it sure. no longer the real presence? And, right. And what does receiving the, you know, the Eucharist and the real presence of Christ do to us? Sure. Uh, that's something, well, the, the second part, I didn't really address it in the in the paper, I mean, I, I thought about it, but I also knew that I wasn't going to have time, so I didn't do it. Um, the basic teaching on, on the real presence is that the, the real presence is there as long as the accidents are discernible. So if you masticate the host and swallow the host, and it's no longer discernible accidentally, then the real presence is no longer present. And, and something similar with regard to the wine. What does remain, of course, and what is part of every sacrament that we partake of worthily is sanctifying grace. So, of course, there's the real communion with Christ, right? And again, koinonia, there's a real communion with Christ. And, you know, St. Augustine said it so well in Book 7 of the Confessions. He said, this is that food that doesn't become part of our body, but we become part of his. There is a real transformation that happens. Again, not that we're assimilating the food, but we're being assimilated to the bread of life. That's important to understand that we're doing that. This is all part of the package of our own deification, that we're being made like God. That's what grace does, after all. Grace assimilates us to God, assimilator deo, right? To be assimilated to God. Um, 
I'm not sure we always think about that when we're receiving the Eucharist, uh, but that is what's going on, right? So, um, what was the second part? Did I answer that? Oh, I already answered that. Okay. <clears throat> yes, sir. So, thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, sure. My question is, um, you said that when you receive the Eucharist, you receive the entirety of Christ. Of course. So, but is any, and, and forgive me, this may be a little remedial, but no. um, is any part of that Christ's, it's, I guess, my guess is it's not, but is any part of it spiritual? Is it spiritual oh. Oh. part of it? Yeah, no, that, that, that's actually a, a very good question. Um, many of the theologians that, that you'll read on this, on this mystery will even talk about the sacramental presence as a spiritual presence. What would, be, uh, what would be wrong, you'd be going too far, if you me merely spiritualized the presence altogether? That's Ulrich Zwingli and uh, uh, other reformers like um, Echolampadius and a few others. Um, by the way, there was a precursor to that, too, with Barangarius, um, who was also condemned uh, much earlier, way before the, uh, the uh, reformers had dealt with that question. So, no, there's still, there's something spiritual in as much as Christ in the real presence, so he's bodily present in the Eucharist, and yet he exists in a kind of spiritual mode, as I was trying to make a comparison to angels in the soul, in that, um, it, well, he, he can't be divided in that mode, right? You really can't divide him. You, you, know, you, you never have half of Christ because he exists in this kind of spiritual mode, okay? So there, the problem is you have to distinguish the modes, but what I'm affirming that exists in this spiritual mode is none other than the body of Christ. And that's where uh, the Catholic would clearly distance himself from the Zwinglian or some other that would merely spiritualize. Okay, so that's a very good question. And, uh, and we can still use that language of spiritual presence as long as we use it correctly. Yeah. Hi. I wanted to ask you about something you said earlier. You were talking about um, something about we shouldn't be guilty about going into Arianism, and it was something else you said. Oh, in terms of uh, Trinitarian theology, I talked about the two principles that guide you, the unity principle and the distinction principle. If you err too much in the unity principle, you may fall into something called modalism, also known as Sabellianism, basically not really distinguishing the persons in any real way. Mm -hmm. You kind of collapse the persons into one, okay? The other error would be if you, uh, if you distinguish the persons but you don't have uh, that rooted in the, in the divine simplicity, you can fall into Arianism, mm -hmm. uh, but in the modern context, well, of course, you still have Arians around. There's no yeah. question about that. Jehovah's, Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses, or, or the certainly, Mormons. yeah. <laughs> but what is a, a real problem today with certain philosophers, especially of an analytic bent of mind, is they fall into tritheism. They they reject divine simplicity. They understand something about the real distinctions within the persons, but they don't have any real way of 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 dealing with the unity in any robust metaphysical way once they jettison divine simplicity. And so what you really have is you have three divine persons in a very anthropomorphic mode by, we, by which each one has his own center of consciousness. That is not the Trinity. The Trinity is one God, yes, three persons. That's a whole nother lecture, that's a whole nother course. Um, really to understand the Trinity, let me just give you one little taste of that. When we say three persons, we don't mean three in the quantity sense. You can't count the persons of the Trinity. I'm just going to leave it at that. That's absolutely right. Uh, I could explain it, but it, I do that in a whole course, <laughs> okay? Um, so yeah, they are not three countable persons, and we even use the term person, which was used early on by uh, Tertullian, and then of course by other Latin fathers such as Augustine, to describe the three. But I would agree with Anselm. 
three I don't know what's. We only use person as an analogy to try to understand the threeness, but it's not a quantitative threeness. That's the mystery of the Trinity. It's all about mysteries, folks. <laughs> all right. Modalism. Join me in thanking Dr. Liberto. Thank you all for joining us here this evening. Um, hope that you can join us for our next uh, lecture in May on May when, uh, May nineteenth, the third Wednesday of May. I'll be I'll be giving a presentation on Eucharistic images and art. So we'll look at some of the most famous images um, from some of the most you know, brilliant painters throughout the church's history. And we'll kind of read the paintings together to see what do they teach us about the Eucharist? You know, what is the, the symbols and the postures and, and what are uh, the various movements of the painting trying to, trying to convey to us and, um, so that it can enrich our faith and our imaginations. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for uh, our next presentation, and please invite family and friends. And um, until then, I hope you uh, have a very blessed Easter season. Thank you.